Chapter 3 Krishna's Cave Our collective consciousness flows like a river. Its banks are time. Origins forgotten, it carries stories and hurts of the past, digs up drama and dreams in the present, barrels toward the unknown with hope. We, tiny drops of that river, tumble along with the writhing masses for a while, shaped and reshaped by the experiences of our time each of us clinging to the silt of the past, digging up drama in the now. Wailing, laughing, hurting, healing, we write our own stories and make ourselves the heroes of this play. Once in a while, a drop of that river becomes aware and realizes that it does not have to be the river, that it has no attachment to the silt from the past or the drama of the present. Its hopes are not the hopes of the river. And in a leap of awareness and mindless courage, it splashes out of the river toward the searing sun and becomes cloud. From its vantage view, it sees the struggles and hopes of the surging waters. It witnesses laughter and tears. It remembers, but remains unfettered. Krishna is a drop of the river that chose to become a cloud. It has been two weeks since I came to stay with Krishna in his cave. I have not gone back to Bhairav Jump. The cave is a little distance interior to a cliff face. The narrow entrance leads to a small grotto and then into a rather large room. This is where Krishna and I sleep. He has shared his clothes and blankets with me. We sleep on the floor on folded blankets, our sleeping spaces separated by a tiny fireplace in the middle. Krishna has created a larger fireplace in the grotto. This is where we cook our food. We close the entrance to the cave with a door of branches and boughs woven together with rope. This keeps out the wind and snow on cold, windy nights. When it is a little warm, we move the door and sit by the fire in the grotto and talk. Most evenings I find Krishna looking away dreamily past the mouth of the cave, sipping on his tea. The clouds float quietly over the deep gorge outside the cave, engulfing us in a shawl of grey. Sometimes the sun peeps through the clouds in a brilliant effervescence of silver and gold. The steaming tea is a perfect antidote to the monotony of the cold evenings. Making and drinking tea is one of Krishna's greatest pleasures. It is a routine that he never misses. Making tea in the mountains requires planning. On rainy days, Krishna leaves a clean vessel out in the open to collect water. When there is no rain, we collect fresh snow. He filters the water and then sets it on a rolling boil on the metal tripod over the fireplace. It is soothing to watch him make tea. The tea powder and masalas are arranged in little airtight containers that he stocks on a little protrusion on the cave wall, along with salt and condiments. He carefully measures out the tea powder in tiny spoonfuls, empties it into the boiling water, and gently taps the spoon on the edge of the pot. He grinds the cardamom, cloves, cinnamon, and dried ginger in a tiny mortar and pestle, and carefully adds the masala in pinches to the boiling tea. Every action is deliberate, artful, an act of love. Some days, when he feels up to it, he uses condensed milk and brings out the biscuits. If I had not been tagging along, he probably would have had condensed milk and biscuits every day. Since I am here, we now have to ration the cans, just as we ration all other food. Rice, pulses, pickles, even the sewn leaf plates we use for eating food. But Krishna does not complain. He goes about his days with absolute contentment, calmly and deliberately, a half smile on his face. He does not at all seem bothered that I have invaded his personal winter haven and I am using up his resources. In the inner room of the cave there is a pile of Krishna's stuff wrapped in plastic. Krishna rummages through the pile for additional blankets. He pulls out an old-fashioned tape recorder from somewhere under the heap along with a plastic bag full of cassette tapes. He smiles as he shows this to me. Some of these tapes have old Hindi songs, he tells me. I don't know which ones. 
Unfortunately, I overwrote most of these tapes with my own ramblings. You can use this if you want. If you want to listen to songs or at some point you feel like you want to record your own thoughts and play them back. Thank you, but I cannot imagine recording over what you have recorded. He laughs. <laughs> it doesn't really matter, Arjuna, he assures me. When I bought this cassette player years ago, I thought it would bring me comfort to listen to songs from my past. These are songs that evoke in me memories of my childhood. But sometimes even memories can feel like prisons. I get a lot of time for reflection here. So, as ideas came up, I started recording them over the songs. I felt proud of my thoughts for a while. Then, one day, it struck me. There is nothing that I was sharing that has not already been said. I realized there is more truth and wisdom in silence. So I bundled up my cassettes and put them under the top. I am learning now how to listen to the voices of silence. I receive the player and bags of cassettes and batteries from Krishna. The cassettes are old. Most are soundtracks of Hindi movies from the 1960s and 70s. Krishna has scribbled on the inner pads in Hindi, thin gnarly ballpen words that are hardly legible. There are cassettes labeled acceptance, peace, seeking, and some which I cannot decipher. I'm curious to learn what lessons these cassettes have for me. When the snow muffles the sounds of the day, thoughts grow louder and louder. Krishna's tapes have become my reprieve from the clamor inside. There are only a few batteries, so I am careful to ration my cassette time. But as I listen to his recordings, I try to commit the essence of his words to memory so I can reflect on them in the endless silence of this winter, like a cow chewing mental cud. I remember hearing that the answers are always available for those who have the right questions. Whenever my heart is troubled, I reach out to a random tape and play it at whichever place it has stopped at. As wild as my approach is, the universe seems to send me that which I need to hear most. I have stopped questioning the ways of the universe. 